Hello and welcome to lecture number 26. This is topic 2.15, Maroon Societies and Autonomous Black Communities. The first learning objective says to describe the characteristics of maroon communities in the areas where they emerged across the African diaspora. To begin, maroon communities emerged throughout the African diaspora all across the Western Hemisphere. The earliest one was found in the Dominican Republic, created after an uprising against the Spanish in 1522. They were usually in remote, hidden, inhospitable environments to try and avoid capture. In the Sugar Islands of the Caribbean, they normally started in the interior or the mountains of the islands. Or in continental North America, they would go to the backwoods or the swamps. This meant that they were nearly beyond the purview of the reach of the enslavers. Sometimes, they even entered into alliances with American Indians and were shielded by those American Indian groups like the Seminole in Florida or the Taino in Cuba. Some communities lasted over a full century. The largest example of this is the Quilombo dos Palmares in Brazil. Quilombo dos Palmares was led by Ganga Zumba and later by Zumbi, who are now remembered as national heroes in Brazil. People who lived in these maroon communities were either self-emancipated people or those who were born free in the community. Those who self-emancipated fell into three different categories. The first could have just recently arrived and came very soon after the slave ship, deciding to resist their enslavement. Others would have been seasoned or might have had experiences working in the system of slavery. The last would have been those that were enslaved for a while and had developed skilled labor abilities that would have been opposed to the system of slavery taking away their wages and labor. Inside these communities, they preserved and blended African-based languages and cultural practices. Many of these communities included people from various regions of Africa, whether it be West Africa or Central Africa. The languages created in these communities, known as Creoles, often became the lingua franca of the region. So there was a continued practice of the elements of culture from those places of origin, like the music, musical instruments, dances, healing practices, and as we already mentioned, Creole languages. The residents faced illnesses, starvation, and a constant threat of capture, especially in areas that were quite humid, tropical, or near swamplands. They were at risk of getting sick with mosquito-borne diseases. The remoteness and inhospitable qualities of the places they settled may have been good for evading capture, but they were also not great for growing food. Sometimes they would grow what they could, but other times they hunted to try and sustain themselves, or they would lead raids into the plantations to take whatever food they could Many maroon communities developed advanced knowledge of local flora and fauna, which aided their survival and resistance efforts. Enslavers, if they were not going to go out and try to capture the fugitives themselves, sometimes enlisted the help of American Indians to try and recover the fugitives. The examples of maroon communities in the United States include the Great Dismal Swamp, which lies between Virginia and North Carolina. The people who lived here may have been those that ran away and escaped slavery, or those who had purchased their freedom and wanted to remain close to the area where they might have had family members still inside the system of slavery. From the time it was active from the early 1700s to the 1860s, several thousand people would have lived here, though the exact number is not known given that they were so far away from the rest of society. During the antebellum period, because of its remoteness, it was used as a route on the Underground Railroad. In 1823, likely because of the fear of other slave uprisings in the area, there was an attempt by the white communities nearby to try and remove the Maroons from the Great Dismal Swamp, but most of them were able to escape. It wasn't really until 1860 and 1865 that the community began to move away. Some left to fight in the Civil War for the Union, and others finally after achieving emancipation decided to live elsewhere. The Great Dismal Swamp was also a site where free black people and indigenous communities interacted and sometimes formed alliances. Those that were in the United States and lived with indigenous communities included the Black Seminoles. These were people who made alliances with the Seminoles in Florida at a time when the Spanish claimed that territory as part of their empire. Eventually, some of them intermarried with the Seminole tribe and were also removed to Oklahoma during the Trail of Tears with the rest of the Seminoles. Maroon communities also existed outside of the United States, going by different names due to language differences. In Spanish America, they are sometimes called palenques. These were in the Caribbean islands, Mexico, and South America. The place where this name is used most often is in Colombia, where the term palenque also refers to the Creole language that was created on the Caribbean coast of Colombia. It is Spanish-based, but also has elements of Kikongo. In Mexico, the major palenque in Salón Lorenzo de los Negros, which was later renamed Siyanga after the Maroon leader who fought off Spanish capture and attained free status for the community. Yanga is considered one of the first liberators of the Americas, having achieved freedom for his community in 1609. In Brazil, they are called Quilombos. The largest one in Brazil was Quilombo dos Palmares, founded in the early 1600s. At its height, it probably had about 30,000 inhabitants and was near the modern-day city of Recife. 
Quilombo dos Palmares had a complex and organized society with elected leaders and a council. And during its existence, it was nearly in a constant state of war. The Portuguese continued to try to recapture the enslaved, and they were finally successful in 1649. However, because Brazil continued to practice slavery until 1888, there were other Quilombos active through the 1800s. The second learning objective says to describe the purpose of Maroon Wars throughout the African diaspora. Maroon leaders and militias staged wars against these colonial governments. These are distinct from slave revolts because people in Maroon communities were not enslaved and they had different goals and motives. They aimed to protect their freedom and autonomy. Because of their previous experience with warfare in their home countries in Africa, they employed guerrilla tactics, which meant that they would attack, retreat, and hide in the backwoods or in an inaccessible area. Maroon communities traded goods with individuals in the colonial system, and sometimes this was considered a tribute so that the European community would allow the Maroons to continue to stay there as long as they continued to pay their tribute or trade goods with them. However, the colonial governments were not always friendly and wars did arise. Anytime the war was successful for the Maroons, they could enter into a treaty with the colonial government and gain recognition as a free town, meaning that everyone inside the community would be recognized as free as long as they refused to admit any newcomers and returned any fugitive slaves that entered into the community. Treaties between Maroons and colonial powers were often fragile and could be broken by either party. Now we're going to discuss two different examples of Maroon leaders who fought against European powers. The first one is Bayano, a Mandinka king from West Africa. Bayano's rebellion is one of the earliest recorded Maroon rebellions in America. He was enslaved by the Spanish in 1552 and sent to Panama. In that same year, he led a rebellion against the Spanish that lasted several years. Because the Spanish were unable to subdue Bayano and his followers, they offered recognition of freedom to his Maroon community, but the understanding that they would refuse any newcomers and return any runaways. Bayano and his community were also enlisted by Sir Francis Drake in the 1570s when he was in the area raiding and attacking Spanish settlements and ships. The next is Queen Nani in Jamaica. She was an Ashanti woman from Northwest Africa and a spiritual leader in the community of Eastern Jamaica. These were called the Windward Maroons settlement because of their location on the island. They were composed of culturally heterogeneous groups, meaning that they had a blend of cultures from all parts of Africa. And Nani led the Windward Maroons during the First Maroon War from 1728 to 1739. She was prayed for her use of guerrilla warfare and camouflage, which helped keep the British from successfully taking over the Maroon communities. Her attacks on the British coincided with attacks from the Leeward Maroons, led by Maroon leader Kojo. In the 1739 and 1740 peace treaties between the British and the two Maroon communities, the Leeward and the Windward Maroons led to recognition of freedom for all people inside the community and land grants, making them genuine free towns. Queen Nani is considered a national hero in Jamaica, and her legacy is celebrated annually on National Heroes Day, along with other national heroes of Jamaica. When she was added to the list of national heroes in 1975, she was the first female edition. Lastly, her portrait is printed on national currency, taking up the $500 bill. And finally, here's the recap. Maroon communities emerged across the African diaspora in remote areas. They were made up of fugitives and those born in the community with a blend of culture and language inside. In the future U.S. territory, Maroons formed in the Great Dismal Swamp between Virginia and North Carolina and among American Indian communities like the Seminoles in Florida. Examples outside of the U.S. include the Palenques and the Quilombos. And finally, Maroon communities often staged wars or entered into treaties with colonial governments. Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, click the thumbnail on the screen. And if you would like more resources to help you study, you can visit apushlights.com slash afam. I wish you the best of luck with your studies, and I hope to see you back on the next lecture.